Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second virtual Green Tech session. We have three longtime friends of the program today to speak with you on our theme, reducing a vessel's carbon footprint. I am very pleased to announce that we have over 350 registered attendees today for our session. So thank you all for coming, for spending your time with us. I am Eleanor Curtley. I am Green Marine's Senior Program Manager based in Seattle, Washington. I'm also joined today by my coworkers, Minel Lempier and Ariane Charette, who have really coordination IT logistics for everything. This Green Tech web series, we were all really excited to not be together in person last week in Montreal, which would have been our 13th annual Green Tech Conference but we are so grateful that we were able to pivot onto this online platform with a number of our speakers and a number of our sponsors who really made this possible. I think an increase our reach for folks who are going to be able to join us without being able to travel. So thank you so much to our sponsor, Gold Sponsors, that now have the same ones we can incorporate in Canada, the same way, Development Corporation under USDOT. Canfernav and Degani, our silver sponsors, Port of New Orleans, Port Canaveral, Shipping Federation of Canada, Port of Seattle, Port of Quebec, Montreal Gateway Terminals Partnership, and bronze sponsors, Quebec Delegate Minister for Transport, Chantel Rouleau, Chamber of Marine Commerce. So the plan for this me, Elena, you're, yep. you're, kind, you're kind of breaking up. I don't know if it's because you're moving, but the sound is breaking up a bit. Just, just uh, maybe watch, uh, watch a bit what you, I don't know if it's on your headphones or what, but it, it's breaking up sometimes. Hmm. I'm not doing anything differently than I was before. Do you want me to try something else? It's fine now. We are you okay, of course. Now that I tell you it works. So okay. <laughs> you're okay now. Great. We'll play an A for today. We'll see if we have to adjust. Is we have three speakers each giving a 15 to 20 minute talk about a five minute QA session. Please open up your QA box. There should be an icon in the lower portion of your Zoom user interface. Enter your question, please direct it to a speaker in particular so we can get as many responses as possible. People are saying you can't hear me. Manon, do I need to try something else? Yes, because it's breaking up. Sometimes it's nice and then it starts uh, with, uh, there's a lot of statics on the line. I don't know why. It was fine when we, uh, we started. Sorry, everyone else. Eleanor is going to hook up some mic. Okay, one second. In the meantime, do you want to tell them the plan for our timeline? Yes, of course. So uh, we have three speakers and uh, an hour and a half uh, for the session. So uh, each speaker will be uh, doing a 20 minute presentation. After each of the presentation, we'll have a Q, uh, quick Q&A. Uh, you can um, uh, type, type in your uh, question into the Q&A uh, window. And uh, it'd be nice if you could uh, add the, the name of the speaker the question is directed to. Um, and uh, it's going to help us and it's going to help the, the speaker afterwards to type in some answer if we don't have time to address. And I'm sure that we won't have time to address all the questions in the, in the live Q&A. Uh, you can also, uh, if you feel like it, it's a question you would have asked or you like that question, you can uh, thumbs up one question and the more, um, the, uh, the more uh, thumbs up that the question gets, the higher it is in the list and the moderator, Elena, will be able to address those questions uh, first. Um, so um, and we, we have a good, uh, a good suggestion here, Elena, that maybe you can uh, turn off your video and uh, just go audio. Maybe uh, your Wi-Fi connection or the connection is not good enough. Maybe it's one solution if, if, uh, if your mic is not working. Do you want to take the end again and see how it works? Sure. Hopefully this will be better. Thank you, Minol, for the help. And please just give me a heads up wave and you can try something else. Is it better? No. No, Eleanor, we, you, we, you keep distorting. I don't know why. Um, okay, 
I'm going to try and stop my video. How's my audio now? It's really nice. Okay, great. Okay, so sorry about that. We will proceed then with our first speaker. She currently Alander, I'm sorry you're breaking up again. Do you want me to uh, to to say Liz bio bio and uh, introduce her? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll I'll just pick it up really quickly. Uh, sorry, everyone. That's the thing with the technology. It's great as long as it works, right? Um, okay, so uh, Lee Kenberg is head of Environment and Sustainability in North America for Maersk, the world's largest container shipping company. She currently serves on the Marine Board of the National Academies of Science. She served on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Air Act Advisory Committee. She's also active in business for Social Responsibilities Clean Cargo Working Group, a global group dedicated to assessing and improving the environmental impact of shipping. Dr. Kinberg has a doctorate in chemistry from the University of South Carolina and joined MERSC in 2005. Lee, I'll leave you the floor. And I'm testing that I'm off mute. Is that good? Okay. All right. Well, hopefully this will work for us all. So the question then is, is zero carbon shipping feasible or even possible in our lifetimes? We've made a lot of progress in terms of energy efficiency, uh, larger vessels, uh, operational controls, network designs, but we still have a long way to go to get to zero and we have to get to zero. So today I'll talk about some of the challenges, some of the progress, some of the outlook, and um, perhaps look to you for some of the new ideas that we'll all need if we're all going to get to zero within our lifetimes. Now there are many marine subsectors and different challenges, everything from fishing boats and ferries up to the very large tankers, cruise lines, uh, container vessels like ours. And so there may be different solutions as we go towards zero carbon in all those different shipping areas. So next slide, please. The question is, who is Maersk? Uh, we are pretty well known for our ocean, um, ocean going vessels. We're also in logistics and services all over the world. We have marine terminals and towage and do manufacturing and several other things. Some of our brands include Maersk Line, Sealand, Hamburg Sud, SAF Marine, Damco, APM Terminals, HUD, Performance Teams, Trade Lens, and there are a few others. So perhaps you'll recognize some of those, but they're all part of the Maersk family of companies and we're all committed to these goals. So on the next slide, this is our global sustainability strategy on one slide. <laughs> um, we did develop this strategy in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and it really includes two pieces. The upper portion is our four shared value projects. These are the projects where we either have a special capability or a special responsibility to make changes in the world. So that would be things like leading in ship recycling industry, uh, helping decarbonize logistics, contributing to having food loss, and multiplying the benefits of trade. Then, of course, you always have the responsible business practices that are essential for any responsible company, things like health, safety, and environmental compliance, human and labor rights, anti-corruption. For us, ocean health is a big one, and diversity and inclusion. So let's focus today on uh, decarbonizing logistics because this is, is a very um, active area for us. So let's go to the next slide. And you'll see that our customers are setting higher and higher expectations and they share these ambitions for us. Um, a lot of these customers are making very bold um, commitments of their own, some based on science-based targets and some not. Um, in many cases, they're zero emissions targets. 
Currently more than 60% of our top 100 customers already have ambitious CO2 targets and more are in the process of establishing targets. In 2018, we did a customer survey that said that 72% seriously consider sustainability parameters when managing their uh, company's supply chain. So they look to emissions reductions and low carbon logistics as main challenges today. That means that we have to make these things happen so that they can reduce their carbon footprint for their shipments. So let's move to the next slide. And of course that requires investments. So where are we today? Well, since 2008, which is the baseline for IMO, we have reduced our uh, carbon footprint by 43% per container transported. So that's based on the Clean Cargo Working Group um, metric. So it is an intensity-based measure, but that's cutting it in half, which, you know, that's, that's pretty good progress. And we're making additional progress as we speak. Our goal on that is to reduce it by 60% by 2030, but you can only do so much with efficiency. So if we're going to get to our goal of net zero carbon shipping by 2050, we have to do some things very differently. We can only do that in collaboration with our customers, with our suppliers, our engine manufacturers, and innovating new technologies and fuels along with those technology and fuel providers. Now, 2050 sounds like a very distant, fluffy goal, but it's really not because vessels built after 2025 are likely to be part of that 2050 fleet. So if we're actually going to be at net zero carbon for the whole fleet by 2050, we have to start today. So on the next slide, you'll see how this backs up. We believe we have to be able to launch the first commercially viable carbon neutral vessel, have it in operation by 2030. To do that, that means contracting for it by 2028, designing it no later than 2027, which means we've got decision points coming up in 2023, 2024 as to how we're gonna do this. So as you can see, this is not a distant fluffy goal. This is a very immediate driver for us. And we are working very hard. We've, got, uh, we've spent over a billion dollars so far to achieve that 43% with retrofits and other things that I've reported to this group in the past. Um, now we have to do something very new and different, and we're trying to do it in something that someone on Lloyd's List podcast last week called an open source manner. We're reaching out to fuel suppliers, to engine manufacturers, to customers, and many other innovators to say, help us figure out how to do this effectively. So again, we have to have that first vessel on the water that is carbon neutral um, by 2030. On the next slide, you'll see the four areas that we really have to work in to make these kinds of things happen. Uh, first, we have to drive innovation in new fuels. We have to design carbon neutral vessels. And of course, that means getting more and more efficient as well as developing those new carbon neutral technologies. We have to build carbon neutral products. And then we have to push for regulatory frameworks to make all of this doable. If you don't have the regulatory frameworks in place, you can't make those changes. So on the next slide, this is the very first carbon neutral ocean product that we've ever launched. Um, and we've actually done it commercially now once. <laughs> uh, we did a pilot last year um, using a biofuel. Uh, it's actually made from used cooking oil recovered from Europe. And we took it to Rotterdam, mixed it into shipping fuel, and actually took the vessel all the way from Rotterdam to Shanghai and back. And that was successful. So then we had, um, went to some of our biggest customers and I said, if you would like to ship some containers carbon neutral, we will do it for you. And this will not be an offset. It will be actually biofuel replacing petroleum fuel. So it actually is carbon neutral. So the shippers agreed to participate in the program. They identify the containers. There is a cost difference for this fuel. The biofuel is not inexpensive. Um, so we purchased that blended biofuel, took, took another vessel starting in November all the way to Shanghai and back um, with carrying um, cargo for a number of our customers. But there's some things I need to tell you about how that works. Um, 
arrived back in Rotterdam in February. Then we take all of the CO2 reductions from the biofuel and we allocate that to, the ship, to those shippers, not just spread it across the average of everyone that's on the ship, but actually allocate it to the shippers that were participating in this program. We're working with the Roundtable for Sustainable Biomaterials Certification and uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to audit and certify the purchase. And there's actually a certificate that's issued to the customer who ships carbon neutral uh, telling exactly how many tons of CO2 were avoided through that biofuel purchase. There's a little more detail on this on the next slide. So again, as I mentioned, this is a biofuel actually reducing the amount of fossil fuel that we use. So this is not an offset, it is a real carbon savings. And the way we're doing it is it's similar to buying green electricity. You know, if you're buying green power or participating in a green power program, you may not actually get the green electrons at your house, but you are actually investing to reduce the carbon footprint of the entire grid to make it greener. In this case, the boxes that those shippers shipped may not be on the exact vessel that burned the biofuel. Some of them are, but some may be on sister ships but the carbon savings are allocated to that shipper because they are real and they are measurable and auditable. So again, we, and then we issue a, a certificate to the customers using the standards set by the Roundtable for Sustainable Biomaterials so that this then becomes the first commercial zero carbon shipments available. And by the way, I'll mention that this biofuel is 100% um, zero carbon if you look at tank to wheel. It's 85% if you look at well to wheel because there is some energy uh, consent used in producing the biofuel. It's also a waste reduction program because it's based on used cooking oil. So let's move on to the next slide. And let's think more broadly about zero carbon, new net carbon neutral fuels, let's call them. So there are a lot of different questions you have to ask yourself and you have to look at the full life cycle and not just one particular piece of it. Um, is, the, is there going to be enough feedstock? Is it cheap enough? Is it sustainable? Is it available where you need it to be? Um, what are the safety aspects of the feedstocks? Can you produce it efficiently? What are the um, carbon impacts or other environmental impacts to that production? We absolutely do not want to compete with anything, any kind of food uh, production. Our commitment is to not use foodstuffs for fuel, but only to use those things that do not compete with food production. How do you get it then to the port where we can actually pick it up and to the right port? And can you store it long term or is it something that has a shelf life? Once you get to the port then and you have to fuel the ship, you have to think about safety considerations, both in the fueling process and on the ship itself. On the fueling system, you need to think about, we have 750 ships around the world. What changes are we going to have to make to the fuel tanks and the fuel storage system and the fuel delivery system on the vessel to operate safely and efficiently? What engine is needed? Can we use the existing engine? Is it a drop-in fuel? Or do we have to modify the engine? Or is this something that can only be done on new vessels with some other new type of engine? So those are all questions we have to ask. And then you can't just, it's not just carbon. We have to think about other more toxic air pollutants, things that might have health impacts like sulfur, uh, nitrous oxides, or nitrogen oxides, uh, par fine particles, other things that might have health effects. And to do all of this, we've got to partner with a number of different folks because we've got to build a new infrastructure if the fuels change and the fuels have to change. So there's going to be investment on the vessel. There's also going to be very significant investment and innovation needed on the land side to make all of this happen. Now moving to the next slide, I've tried to put together, actually several of us have been working on this one, a way of looking at options for potential carbon neutral fuels. So as we go from the top to the bottom, 
we are increasing in complexity. So up here at the top, we've got drop-in or blended fuels. Things like the biofuel we just talked about that you can actually use on the existing vessels where you've got minimal changes to the engine and systems. A little more complex than that would be low flashpoint fuels. This would be something like alcohols or alcohols blended with some other biomaterial like a lignin. Lignin, by the way, is the material that makes plant stems stiff. So it's very, very common around the world. Um, and there, there probably will be some engine modifications. You've got to have um, low flash fuel systems, changes to tanks, and we may have to have what's called a pilot fuel to actually get it to ignite in the engine. And in that case, you might be looking at a biodiesel to make that work. So we have to look at that whole system and consider, uh, does it take electricity? Does it take other energy to produce this? What's the full life cycle impact of each of those choices? Another step up in, in complexity would be non-cryogenic gases like ammonia or DME. There we're getting into a, a much more challenging situation where we're talking about fuels that are in, ga in, in tanks for gases. So they're pressurized. Um, we're talking about gas engines. We're talking about um, a lot of different changes. And this is probably a whole new vessel to make something like that happen rather than something you could retrofit. Another level up of, in terms of complexity from our perspective too is cryogenic gases where not only is it pressurized or you may have to have it actually chilled. If it's, if it's hydrogen, you have to be very, very cold, which means then you have to have ways of um, warming it back up to put it into the engine. The latter three where we're talking about battery, hybrid propulsion, nuclear or fuel cells, are really not to the point that it's really feasible for our big ships that have to spend two and a half weeks crossing the Pacific right now. We're certainly looking in those areas. We're getting ready to test a battery system on one of our vessels, really for peak shaving though and not for propulsion. So it's really to help even out the uh, electric load while we're underway. There are a lot of technology improvements that need to happen before we believe that those latter three would be feasible in commercial applications. So we see the main focus as liquid energy, whether it's in fuel cells or combustion engines. So moving on to the next slide, we really actually expect there to be more than one winner here and there'll be more than one pathway uh, to get to those winners. Um, we're talking about carbon neutral fuels, um, and how do you test them? What are the various parameters we have to look at? How do you build or retrofit carbon neutral vessels? And then further innovation in energy efficiency and um, energy reduction is also essential. To, we've got to get to that 60% so that that only leaves us the other 40 to have to take care of. For the future, we did a study with Lloyd's uh, it's a multi-client study, and they identified three fuels as probably having the highest potential to, to get to that zero carbon in these large commercial applications. They identified alcohols, biomethane, and ammonia fuels. We do see green hydrogen through electrolysis as being critically important for some of these. Um, we also see a high potential in blending things like lignin, with the alcohols because there's no need for a pilot fuel and it lowers the cost. We do see needs for other studies, for example, a biomass availability study. If you're going to go the route of biofuels, how much biofuel is available? The oily biofuels are really a relatively low availability unless you start cutting into foodstuffs. Um, whereas things like lignin have a much higher availability. And then there's carbon capture and storage, and sorry for abbreviating it, CCS. Um, we're evaluating whether investments in carbon capture might actually delay or interfere with investments in some of these other green pathways. Do people count on being able to capture the CO2 and do something with it, rather than uh, really saying, yes, we've got to push forward on finding fuels and systems that will work? independent of carbon capture and storage. So again, a lot of challenge. Uh, we have taken what, uh, what we've called a, 
an open source approach or or we actually hadn't called it that someone on that Lloyd's podcast did and um, I guess the the thing to say is achievements involve risk and if we win we'll be happy and if we lose we will be wise or at least we'll have learned something so um, I appreciate your attention and I'll, I'll be glad to take your questions uh, following this thank you Thank you so much, Lee. Lots of content. Great view on what Maersk is pursuing for zero carbon shipping. How's my audio now? Is that a little better? It is. Thank you. <laughs> Logged off. Logged back on. Great. Control, delete. delete. <laughs> um, first question that I'd like to share with you. Um, in the future, is it expected that vessel size will be much bigger than today's? And is biofuel energy density or output considered in this study or planning? Okay, that's really two different questions. In terms of vessels getting a lot bigger, um, we're already to the point where with current port infrastructure, you're talking about port stays that could be anywhere from five to seven days. So there is a limitation on, on that and you have to, to balance. So I, I personally don't see them getting a lot bigger than they currently are. Um, and for some ports, some services, you're actually better off with something that's smaller in size and more flexible. Um, and what was the second one? It was about biodensity? Yeah, it was the energy density. Biofuels and their density and their output and how that would affect the sizing of vessels, larger or smaller. Um, you do lose capacity if you have to go to a low energy density fuel. In other words, the fuel tanks have to get a lot bigger for example, with LNG, I'm told that the, the fuel storage systems and fuel handling systems would be two and a half to four times as large as the current ones. So, you know, th that may be worth it, but those are trade-offs you absolutely have to consider. So energy density is certainly a consideration. Okay. One more from an anonymous attendee. Would you be able to please give us an example of a regulatory change that you might be looking for? And I think that was referencing your slide that had kind of the pathway to market oh, adoption. Yeah, well, the, the fact that there need to be regulatory changes. Um, do you currently have, for just to, to use, and I'm talking regulatory, pardon my walk, talking with my hands. Um, I'm talking regulatory in the fairly, fairly broad uh, perspective. Are there, um, ISO standards for these new fuels? Do we have all of the class structures and inspection structures in place? How does this fit into IMO's goals? How does this fit into the IMO rules? What are the other impacts in terms of MARPOL 6? Um, and then you get into other things about that, that may be challenging in terms of producing or storing or transporting some of these new fuels that also have hazards. Mm -hmm. Lots of considerations. Good to be planning ahead towards 2030, towards 2050. We have our work ahead of us. All right, well, thank you again, Lee. I think we'll transition now to our second speaker. We have Anthony Teo of DNVGL. He brings more than 20 years of maritime experience and 17 years of experience in DNVGL. His, previously, his previous roles in the organization include Fleet in Service Surveyor in Singapore, LNG Carrier New Building Project Manager in Korea, and Head of Department of Offshore New Building and Conversion in Singapore. He is currently based in Houston. He is responsible for business development with a strong focus on new technology for maritime application, LNG as a marine fuel, gas ships, energy efficiency, and hybrid ships and technology. Welcome and thank you, Anthony. Yes, can you hear me well? Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Green Tech, for giving me this opportunity for this uh, virtual uh, webinar. It's, a, it's an honor and uh, it's a great pleasure to be on the same panel with uh, Lee and Mark and, of course, Eleanor. Um, well, I, I, I'd like to thank again to Lee for uh, establishing a good uh, background on, uh, you know, paving the way for a, a carbon-free uh, shipping environment. And uh, I would like to, uh, in my presentation, reinforce some of the things that she said, and also give you some perspective of uh, using ammonia as an alternative fuel in this space. So may I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, the background towards 
zero carbon pathways, uh, basically the motivation why uh, the shipping sector is looking towards uh, carbon uh, free uh, uh, route. Uh, talk a little bit on the ammonia as fuel and how it actually fits into the maritime space. Uh, regulatory perspective, I think this is quite important. Uh, and uh, from, the, from what, I, what we see, uh, I think the, our audience is also looking very much on where, what are the changes uh, for these types of fuel when it comes into play. Uh, some technical uh, and safety considerations when you use uh, ammonia as alternative fuel and also um, see how the ammonia uh, trade is actually doing um, and how we can optimize uh, maybe uh, uh, leverage on some of these uh, trade routes that we are seeing right now. And of course, uh, just to summarize how we uh, should, how should we pave the way forward uh, using maritime, uh, uh, using ammonia in the maritime space. Next slide, please. So next background and uh, zero, uh, towards a zero path, uh, uh, towards zero uh, carbon, uh, zero carbon pathways. Um, I think, um, Lee, next slide please. Lee actually uh, showed a graph very similar to this. Uh, basically in uh, 2018, uh, IMO under the MEPC 72 session actually agreed on this ambitious uh, greenhouse strategy to decarbonize uh, maritime. And this uh, charts towards uh, 2050, towards uh, zero emissions. And of course, uh, you know, we are basing on the 2008 uh, emission levels and we're trying to reduce it uh, to 50% uh, by 2050 and uh, towards 2100 uh, to zero. Very ambitious. I think the key takeaway here is uh, the boxes that you see in the, in the slide, uh, the midterm and uh, the long-term perspective. Where do shippers and where do the customers like ourselves, uh, when, when we buy our products off the shelf, what kind of carbon footprint uh, will these products be in, uh, or will actually be packed with uh, when we purchase these things? And uh, how are the shippers going to reduce these uh, carbon footprint? And, and I think um, if you look at a short term perspective, there are already uh, a lot of uh, emission controls and uh, indexes and uh, ship management plans that are going to be uh, tightened. Um, and uh, there are going to be energy efficiency indicators that will be instituted. Uh, carbon cap, uh, carbon recording, uh, CO2 recording will be uh, in a way uh, very transparent. And um, a lot of uh, national uh, governments uh, will be implementing plans to actually uh, to, to, to pressurize or to reduce these uh, footprint. So from a midterm perspective, um, there are no choices. There, there are no other ways to, to if we want to meet the uh, IMO carbon uh, strategy and ambition, we have to act uh, from a midterm and a long-term perspective. And I think this is what uh, MERS is actually doing. And a lot of uh, shipping owners and managers are also um, focusing on these efforts, their efforts uh, and working towards these uh, goals. Um, I think, uh, next slide, please. So if we were to keep uh, the, or if we were to, uh, if we want to meet the ambitions of the IMO, I mean, there, there are four pillars to actually achieving this. Um, logistic and visualization uh, improvements, hydrodynamics improvement, machinery improvements, as well as uh, fuel and energy resources. I think this is very much in line with what Lee actually says. But if you look at the, the bottom uh, boxes, uh, by implementing all these measures, it will go only give you certain uh, in, uh, benefits, if you like. And uh, the way we see it, uh, the fuel and energy resources would probably and most likely give you the best benefit uh, when it comes to decarbonization uh, towards 2050. Uh, next, next click, please. So um, I think, as I said earlier, uh, significant greenhouse gases uh, can only be achieved by technical and operation managers uh, measures. And uh, the, only, uh, uh, the only way that we think that uh, has the best impact is uh, through the fuel and energy resource change. Uh, but then again, uh, there are a few things uh, with regards to barriers, cost, availability, uh, and structure, and onboard storage will actually uh, Consideration will actually be a main uh, barrier when it comes to these kinds of implement uh, when we want to implement such uh, 
uh, such uh, goals or such measures. Next slide, please. Um, in 2019, the uh, uh, DNBGL uh, actually uh, made a maritime forecast uh, to 2050, and uh, in, in this report, um, which is uh, which you see here, uh, the energy fuel mix towards 2050, we made a prediction on how um, how will the 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 uh, shipping uh, environment or the shipping uh, industry uh, have to move uh, if we want to achieve the IMO uh, ambition. And uh, this is one of the past pathways uh, uh, towards 2050, which is uh, what we think would be the most stringent. And uh, as you move along the years, 2020 to 2050, you will see a red uh, area that will be coming in uh, towards uh, 2035. And this is uh, the implementation of ammonia, which is quite an interesting uh, 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 scenario, which I think uh, was actually highlighted in uh, Lee's presentation. And, and this is, seems to be a very viable uh, solution if, uh, at, of course, uh, this has to only be uh, obtained through uh, renewable energy. Right. Next slide, please. Next, please. A little bit on the ammonia. Um, if you were to look at uh, the ammonia as a fuel or a chemical, um, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar or have seen, uh, have come across ammonia in, in, at some point of time. Uh, but uh, just a brief introduction. Well, um, ammonia is basically a uh, carbon-free uh, chemical, if you like. Um, it does not contain any carbon. Uh, it's easy to store on board, uh, on board a ship, I mean. Uh, compared to uh, hydrogen, it is cheaper to store. Uh, and easier to store uh, up to 10 bars uh, at ambient temperature. And if you look at the box uh, on the right hand side, uh, it stays uh, liquid form at minus 33 degrees Celsius. And uh, at 20 degrees, seven bars, uh, there's no cryogenic uh, temperatures required. Um, the uh, flash point for ammonia is about 48 degrees Celsius and the uh, explosive limit is beyond between uh, 15 to 28 percent. So it's very similar to uh, LNG, except for the flash point part of it. So it has some advantage uh, as far as uh, keeping LNG uh, compared to LNG. Um, compared to hydrogen, it's, um, there is, as I said earlier, it's cheaper and easier to store. Uh, no fuel cells uh, needed, um, and uh, the energy density is much higher than compressed hydrogen. Uh, however, there are some uh, challenges when it comes to uh, handling of uh, ammonia. It is very dangerous, uh, I would say. Um, if you look at the, uh, the boxes on the, on the bottom, uh, there are safety limits which a human can actually withstand. Uh, it is corrosive, toxic, and it's an environmental, environmental hazard if it's not handled uh, safely. And of course, uh, you, know, you don't want to you handle these kinds of chemicals uh, with, uh, without any protection. So this is very important to, uh, to remember. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, so far, as far as, we, as far as we see today, um, most of the ammonia that is uh, uh, produced in the world, uh, it's uh, mainly from natural gas, 68%, uh, 28% from coal and 4% uh, from uh, oil. And uh, the annual production uh, a year is about 170 million tons. And uh, 20, 18, 18 million of these uh, production is actually traded uh, by, by ships. And uh, if you were to look at the consumption, world fleet consumption in 2012, well, it's actually very similar to uh, last year's numbers as well. It's about 300 million tons, uh, corresponding to about 650 million tons of uh, ammonia if you want to replace all liquid fuels uh, with ammonia. Um, another point to note about uh, ammonia, majority of the uh, ammonia is actually consumed uh, via fertilizers. And uh, nearly half the population uh, is actually fed through the harbor Bosch process. And uh, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, ammonia competes, uh, or rather ammonia as fuel uh, competes with food production. As I said, you know, most of the ammonia that's produced today are actually uh, uh, channeled through, uh, through the work food industry as fertilizers. So if you were to reduce, or if, you re if we want to um, use ammonia as fuel, 
uh, it will be a big challenge because you probably have to ramp up your production four times uh, to uh, for the for the world fleet to actually consume ammonia uh, as a marine, as a marine uh, marine fuel, uh, and uh, it's there are limited capacities as well. I mean, so it means to say that there are limited capacity, and it's, it's important to remember. So this corresponds to my next slide, please. Uh, the chart here you see is uh, the uh, fuel cost uh, per ton uh, of uh, MGO, MGO equivalent. And if you look at where ammonia stands, this is, uh, there, it's about, uh, it's the, probably the second highest uh, compared to all the alternative fuel. And this is uh, uh, not uh, considering a, uh, not considering uh, putting ammonia as fuel in the market as a bunker. So right now, if you compare, the, the prices here is actually plugged in from uh, ammonia as used as fertilizers. But if you were to put it uh, as a marine fuel uh, and, uh, and, and compete it against the food production, it, it probably will be a different story. Probably will go up uh, and, and it will be higher than biofuel itself or biodiesel. So that's another point to, to remember. Next slide, please. From a regulatory perspective, um, next slide, please. It's uh, very important to understand uh, how, uh, how if you were to use ammonia as fuel, how does it fit in uh, from a regulatory perspective? Uh, does it exist? Uh, well, it, it's, a, it's, it's a yes and a no, um, and I'm here to explain to you. Well, uh, if you were to look at the two uh, documents on the right, um, it's the IGF code uh, and the IGC code. The IGF code is the International Code of Safety for Ships Using ga Gases or Low Flare low flash point fuels. Uh, basically, it is meant for ships uh, burning alternative fuels, such as LNG and low flash point fuel, and ammonia would come into this category. For IGC code, is the transportation of uh, gases. Ammonia is in this category as well, uh, but as I said earlier, it is only for the carriage of cargo. So um, in short, um, it's uh, if you were to use ammonia as fuel, you can use the IGF code uh, to, uh, to, as a regulatory uh, framework to actually uh, put it onto a vessel to burn, LNG, uh, to burn ammonia as fuel, but not directly or not uh, as prescriptive as it seems uh, because uh, the ammonia, ammonia is actually not listed as one of the fuels in the IGF code. However, there are certain uh, routes or there, there are some, some alternatives for administrations or to, for or flag states to actually accept this um, this uh, this view, uh, but uh, you need to do a, a hazard or risk analysis and present it to the administration uh, before it can be accepted. Next slide, please. Um, the reason why I'm showing you this is because uh, the IGF IGC code, as I said earlier, um, is for the carriage of um, ammonia or, or, or gases and ammonia comes into this category and if you were to cap if you were if you were to uh, utilize uh, or rather the best way forward for maritime sector to actually utilize uh, ammonia as fuel is for ammonia carriers or LPG carriers to utilize this fuel first because uh, it makes sense for you to carry uh, your cargo and burn it uh, in your engines because then you will not have to basically dedicate a fuel tank if you like, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, you basically uh, have a separate uh, tank and uh, be able to utilize the tank or the, the, the cargo in your tanks or in your cargo tanks to actually burn it. Uh, however, as I said earlier, it is it's still not, re not, not acceptable for the, for the IGC code um, to use uh, ammonia as fuel. And it is uh, something which is very uh, interesting. And uh, I think uh, if we were to uh, want, if we want to actually have this, uh, or if you're serious about using ammonia as fuel, uh, then we will have to do something about the IGC GC code uh, uh, in the near future. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Technical and safety considerations. Um, I think this is also a very in interesting or important uh, factor to, uh, to consider. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you look at the LNG as a fuel 20 years ago, um, we are right now, we are in a way uh, very similar to uh, LNG as fuel 20 years ago for ammonia. 
because uh, 20 years ago, a lot of these things were not discussed or had to be, uh, had to be overcome. Um, but uh, I'll just give you a quick update. Um, to date, uh, we'll see, we've, we have actually seen some uh, technology improvements and some technology advancements uh, for um, uh, in, uh, in internal combustion engines, uh, two-stroke engines uh, that are being uh, in, at the research stage to, to actually burn ammonia in the fuel, uh, in, in the in the combustion in, uh, chambers. So it's it's uh, it's being uh, developed right now. Uh, but I hope in the near future we will see some of these uh, projects uh, coming into uh, into fruition. Um, as far as the uh, fuel uh, valve trains is concerned, they are uh, already uh, they are already available uh, because uh, they have adopted uh, on uh, on the learnings of uh, LNG as fuel. Uh, and uh, a lot of these uh, technologies are available. Same goes for the gas handling system, very similar to LNG as well, as, well as the storage uh, concept availability because, um, as I said earlier, LPGs are actually carrying uh, ammonia in, in, uh, and they're transferring car them as uh, cargo right now. Um, what we are hoping to see uh, in the near future is uh, uh, fuel cells um, being developed uh, using ammonia. Uh, there are some pilot projects uh, uh, ongoing uh, and, uh, in, in, a, in a demonstration uh, form, and uh, we hope that uh, we can tap on some of these learnings and, and, and share with the public very soon. Uh, one of the challenges that we see today is uh, uh, the NOx emission, because uh, remember the uh, composition of uh, ammonia is uh, nitrogen plus uh, hydrogen, so the nitrogen component is still a challenge for if we want to uh, meet the NOx the NOx emission uh, limitation on limits. Next slide, please. Yes. So some of the technical considerations, are, I won't read out all of this uh, in, the, in the benefit of time, but uh, basically it's, it's very similar to uh, what we've actually gone through with uh, LNG as fuel uh, 20 years ago. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, we have to remember is uh, ammonia contamination. Uh, because uh, as I said earlier, ammonia is a very toxic gas. And uh, it's very important that uh, if there's any leakages, uh, all these, uh, these toxic chemicals uh, are not, uh, do not go into uh, man's spaces. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, the after treatment uh, with regards to uh, catalytic converter to handle the uh, NOx. Next slide, please. Um, so from a life cycle and technical economic consideration perspective, I think uh, as far as the technical challenges is, uh, is uh, overcome, um, we still need to look at the carbon footprint that actually is actually, uh, uh, how it's actually uh, being produced. Uh, as what Lee was saying, you know, most of the, uh, renewables or most of the uh, fuels that we, we have to, uh, that, that has, that we put in the tank, we have to really consider the carbon footprint and the most, very importantly, uh, how, uh, how these fuels are being uh, produced and uh, renewable is uh, going to be dominating uh, the scene uh, when it comes to alternative fuel in the future. So it's important to see how, what are the cost benefits uh, as uh, compared to the carbon uh, emissions when it comes to uh, the production of ammonia. Um, and of course, uh, the capex that is being, uh, that needs to be put into uh, these uh, assets uh, when you, when you uh, adopt this view. Uh, next slide, please. From a shipping and trade perspective, uh, just to give you a brief uh, overview of where ammonia is being shipped and traded. Uh, next slide, please you will see that the uh, majority of the uh, exporters and the importers, uh, I will talk about the major exporters right uh, first, uh, are actually coming out from Russia. Uh, this is the ammonia ship bond trade. Um, there are a lot of, um, uh, I would say producers, but uh, this is more focused on the, the exporters from a maritime perspective, where the, where the ammonia are being shipped out. Um, about uh, 12 million, 13 million tons of ammonia is being exported, and the import side will be about uh, 10 million tons. Um, the major exporter would be Russia and Latvia, and uh, of course, you would see United States as one of the major exporters. Next slide, please. If you map it out from a world map perspective, you know you will see um, where the locations uh, of the 
loading ports and the discharge port from a, from a global perspective. And you, it will be very interesting to see how we can actually set up a, a bunker infrastructure within these uh, hubs. And I think this will probably be the, uh, the first movers and or locations where uh, ships are calling on and uh, we'll be using ammonia as fuel. Next slide, please. So, um, way forward. Next slide, please. Um, as an just, this is an overview of uh, ammonia as, uh, as an alternative fuel, uh, com as a marine fuel compared to other alternative fuel uh, for the maritime space. And if you look at the whole table itself, uh, breaking down to uh, several uh, priority parameters, uh, uh, and to the right, how uh, the uh, energy source is being obtained. Ammonia seems to be um, the most, provides the best potential when it comes to the renewable uh, uh, sector, if you like, of uh, source, uh, because um, it, it does, uh, it, it gives you the most, uh, the least of the rates, if you like. And I think uh, going forward, we will see more development and more uh, advancement in this uh, space uh, as we adopt the, this, uh, this view. Next slide. So for the next steps, um, I think what's very important is to test and qualify the technology for ammonia as a marine fuel, uh, because uh, there's, uh, there, are, there are a lot of talks right now and uh, engine development is being, uh, is being carried out. Um, what, what needs to be done is to really understand the risk uh, and detailed studies uh, in, on these projects and also do a, and, and understand the risk uh, when it comes to how we implement on some of these assets. Uh, and, and very similar to what Lee said, uh, how, uh, how the regulatory environment needs to adapt, uh, but then it has to formulate a case for the IMO amendment. And of course, all class rules to have some sort of consolidation uh, which will support the IMO amendment. And of course, crew competence is very important because uh, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort and also training to actually have crew competence uh, to, to be familiar with these type of fuel. And last but not least, uh, end of the day, when all these things are you know, pieced together, it has to be uh, a competitive asset for the ship operator. So with that, I would like to end my presentation and uh, I hope that uh, this gives you a good perspective of how ammonia can uh, provide uh, the shipping and the shipping uh, environment or the ship shippers uh, towards a zero carbon in the environment. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Anthony. And in fact, through your presentation, you answered a number of the questions that we had come up about availability and cost considerations, um, a trade-off with NOx. Um, one question that I'll put forward that's kind of an extension of the prior conversation is about whether ammonia vessels will target, oh, it just jumped around, small and mid-sized vessels that are used in local areas and short distances, routes that due to fuel tank size needed for long trips that would reduce the total cargo capacity. Yeah, so um, I think the, I mean, you can adopt uh, this view for all types of ship. There are no limitations. I, I think that what's important is we need to see how, who are the first movers and who, are, who will be the ones who will be able to adopt fastest or the easiest. I think uh, in my presentation, I'm not sure whether I was clear enough, but uh, for LPG carriers, uh, we think that it's probably going to be the easiest ones to adopt uh, because they are carrying ammonia as uh, a cargo and then you can put it into their tanks or into the engines to burn it. Uh, but there are some challenges from a regulatory perspective. And of course, there are certain retrofits to be made um, when, the engines have been developed uh, for these types of fuel, you know, because of the NOx. Um, and of course, we have to keep the mariners and also ensure that um, all these risks that is associated with this uh, fuel or chemical uh, is actually uh, addressed and, and, and considered as well. Uh, but for small ships, I think it's possible, but probably it will be a little bit later than uh, when later after these LPG carriers or ammonia carriers have adopted because you need to learn and, uh, and adapt uh, the technologies as you go along. Gotcha. Yeah. So most likely it would be ammonia carriers to be the first vessels to burn ammonia as a marine fuel, but it does have broad applications potentially. Great. 
Well, with time considerations, we'll move on. I will remind folks um, that we will probably be able to continue the Q&A, so continue to thumbs up questions that you like to make sure that those get addressed. And we'll move on to our third speaker, Mark Kenneford, has spent 27 years in these systems under extreme C conditions. And then I'll also put forward to, can you speak to integration issues with some of the alternative fuels we've been talking about, like ammonia and methanol? So integration of propulsion technologies with alternative fuel. I struggle to see, to see a link there. Um, I, I guess one of the things I would say is that alternate fuels, we have to look at the engine type we're using. And, and I think we almost need to look at the typical configuration of a, a ship with a single two stroke main engine and a shaft line at, at, um, at a fairly low speed and a very uh, large diameter propeller. Um, and with alternate fuels, I think we need to start looking at different engine types that might uh, perform better with alternate fuels, or maybe they, they need to be you know, four stroke medium speed engines. But we also have the potential by looking at different engine types like four stroke engines that better might better operate or have been further developed with alternate fuels. We had the ability to start looking at hybridization in a way that maybe we don't or haven't been looking at with two stroke engines. So I think alternate fuels give us an opportunity to look at the engines that we're using and, um, and look at propulsion concepts differently. And like I say, bringing in hybridization, um, yeah, that, that brings benefits for sure. Great. Thank so you. May I just add here, uh, just an input. Um, I think uh, I, I kind of agree with uh, Mark. It depends on what kind of engine you're talking about. If you look at a fuel cell as an engine, uh, it does provide electricity, uh, but uh, fuel cells do have uh, some limitation on C states on the six degree of movement mm -hmm. because they don't uh, they don't produce electricity very well under uh, rough weather uh, because you need the constant uh, chemical reaction and if you've got extreme weather conditions uh, the chemical reaction may not be as optimum as, as you like so it does have some implications if you were to talk about alternative fuel on fuel cells. Interesting. Thank you. Far more considerations. A uh, question from Gretchen Barrera. How does air lubrication affect underwater noise? Yeah, it, we haven't tested it. Um, Silverstream would tell you that they haven't. So they haven't, you know, sailed over a sound range. Um, it does provide an insulating effect with um, machinery noise from the hull. So it's, it's um, more engine noise and machinery noise more than it is propeller noise. However, saying that, what they haven't done is evaluated, is there any impact on propeller noise? Um, I think it's a stretch, but that hasn't been evaluated yet. Okay, thank you. We've also had some questions throughout that I'll open up to all three of our speakers about trade-offs and merits of wind and solar as additional energy sources. Um, we, well, we have seen uh, quite a lot of uh, advancement or activities when it comes to uh, wind propulsion, uh, wind propulsion uh, devices or uh, utilizing wind uh, to propel ships. Um, what is very interesting now is you see uh, cruise vessels or luxury yachts adopting these kinds of technologies. Um, we've also seen, uh, I think in Musk, you've also done some uh, platinum rotor projects uh, on the, some of the shuttle tankers. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a viable uh, solution. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it is not for everybody. And uh, you, you need to harness uh, the learnings from previous projects and, and uh, utilize uh, the knowledge going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So yes. solar, solar has been used already in a, in a concept way in a bulk carrier. Um, where they're using solar panels on the upper deck on hatch covers, and they're using the, uh, the energy from the solar uh, panels to charge batteries on the auxiliary, um, auxiliary electrical bus. So it's used not to provide propulsion power, but it's use, being used to charge batteries during the day for the auxiliary bus. And um, I think the experience there is that solar panels are getting more efficient and um, there's, there's, you know, 
it's feasible to use them on the upper deck, but I'm not sure if the energy efficiency yet has been, uh, you know, is feasible. Mm -hmm. and, and Lee, did you want to speak to the solar or wind question as our last Q&A? Well, of course, um, with tankers, you might have room for, for things like, um, or bulkers, you might have room for solar panels or some of the flattener rotors and so forth. Uh, on container ships, you've got containers stacked on deck, sometimes nine high. So you've got a very different wind um, pattern uh, and sail area. Um, so there are other challenges. Certainly, um, we are also looking at windmills to make hydrogen, for example, to make other green power that then can be used to make these alternative fuels so that when you look at the total life cycle from origin all the way to the wake, that you're looking at the lowest possible carbon footprint. But in those cases, those would be, you know, windmills or, or solar that would be on land or, or near shore. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, looking at the whole life cycle right. of, our, of our systems. Um, it seems there isn't one golden bullet magical solution yet, but we have options that each need further review and investigation. Um, thank you very much to our three speakers, Lee, Anthony, and Mark. So much appreciate your contribution. Thank you to our sponsors, our gold sponsors, FedNav, St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation, St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, Degani, and Can for Nav. Thank you to our attendees for spending your time with us today. Again, apologize for my audio issues at the top of this session. Um, please join us again next week for our third Green Tech Thursday. That'll be on the 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we'll again be looking at reducing carbon footprint but from the side of ports and terminals. You can register and find information at our website, green-marine.org. And again, thank you so much. And with that, I think we'll conclude.